I think finally we're connected. Just checking a few things. Hold on. See if I can get the agenda up. Hold on. If I can run that in here. <sighs> Let me see if I can't get the agenda up. Can I drag this into the new window? Rearranging some windows here, folks. Bear with. Why can't I? Oh, she's shy, annoying. I can't drag between windows. It's very strange. Come on. No. I can't. How very, very, very frustrating. Hello out there, please let yourselves be, let me know that you are there. I know I'm late starting. I've had some broadband issues. Um, I'm just trying to get the um, agenda up. It's not letting me move. Move all of my bits across to the other session. Hold on. Let's just add a new scratch file. New. <sighs> okay, we now have an agenda. Thanks for hanging on, um, those that have. I do apologise. I don't quite know why my broadband was doing it. Um, after a restart, it was just going round and round and round and round and round and not actually connecting. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Let's just oh, let's move this one. There's in the way. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
out. So, um, let me give, give you some links. First, that might be useful. Um, here's the forum, which is a useful place to go. You want to continue the conversations. Uh, let me also give you the discard, Discord invite to join me if you want that. Um, you probably already know this, but for people that are watching the recording, that's the uh, that's where we are for the stream on Twitch. Well, good evening. Uh, we're still in lockdown here, surprise, surprise, in the UK. Um, this evening, I wanted to just do a few news items. And then we're going to jump straight into um, PAO stuff. Let's just bring this back up. So, number one, uh, if you're not aware of this, there's a really good uh, USB um, project for FPGA called Luna and Kate Temkin is the one that's doing this. Let me bring up the um, yeah, 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 yeah. browser so I can show you. Don't need that on. Where is Pancho? You just set this up, it's not picking up the page. There we go. Um, so, Kate Temkin is working on this um, rather interesting, very comprehensive uh, USB library, which can be used with the open source tools, among other things. And she, uh, as part of that, she's building a board to do her testing on. Um, which she's recently um, put together. You can see pictures here. But uh, what I noticed the other day was uh, she's actually got some bits and pieces running on there. She's got um, the basic USB examples. So this isn't a general purpose board, although there are PMODs on there. If you look carefully, it's one there and one there. And I think these can also be used to add yet more USB if you need it. Um, got the main host here, look, sideband and the target. So this will sit in between those two. Um, not sure exactly what the sideband does. Does that just copy out what's going on here? Hmm, not sure. Anyhow. Um, it's very interesting. Also, that looks like a double A up there. I wonder if that's bit banged, possibly, from the ECP5, because it's based around the ECP5 board. Um, let me just move this over, because this is annoying. Uh, wrong window. Oh, no. Hmm. Let me give you the URL uh, Twitter here, but it's going to be a really interesting um, project. 
and Kate. And I love those LEDs. Look how she's got them arranged as a, um, let me straighten this up, as a uh, spectrum order, frequency order. She did mention that we, she got um, tried to get these balanced order. And Michael Osman, who's putting it together. As she says here, just look at those amazing LED colors. Did an amazing job of finding the parts that met my vague specifications. Did super well at balancing their brightness. There you can see it. I mean, I always loved it on our black eyes too, but she's gone a step further here. Very nice. Oh, and she's got the uh, pastel ones down there too. Very nice. So that's quite interesting. Um, oh. I thought she was going to link to her um, project. Oh, I see. Do I have a link to this? Damn, she didn't include one. I hope my levels are okay, by the way. Let me know if they're not. Okay, right. Put that. Uh, next item on the list. Um, Claire, i.e. The creator of Yosis uh, has broken away from was it what were they called? Sim? I can't remember what they were called. But uh, she now has her own organisation as of this week. It's called Yosis HQ, and it's actually it. Um, yeah, you, this is the uh, Twitter account. Um, and you can get the um, actual URL of her new organization. Oh, sorry, that's one of those daft hyperlinks. It goes through Twitter's um, shortener. It's actually yosishq.com. Um, so, yeah, there was quite a long thread. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of that this week, but. Um, to manage to separate things, which is good. Ah, thanks, Laurie. Laurie's posted the um, uh, Luna repository link. It's uh, forward slash github.com, obviously, forward slash great Scott gadgets, forward slash Luna. So do check that out. I, I don't know if I'd call it. It's some early days for it. I know. I know there's working bits and bobs down there, but I don't know what the actual status is of the project. I wonder if there's any note. We'd better have a quick peek, actually. Does she say here? Mm. No, it doesn't actually say uh, what the status is. So maybe it's um, maybe it's already in a good way, or certain parts of it. What does a readme say? Sorry, the change. Is there a change log? Uh, license, license. Hmm. No change doc. 
Uh, some of the things you can use Luna for currently are protocol analysis for low, full, or high speed USB. That's like USB 2, presumably. Um, Luna provides both hardware design and gateway that allows passive USB monitoring. When combined with VUSB, USB analyzer toolkit, I'm not even sure what that is. Ah, okay. Nice. Um, Luna Hardware Plus Gateway can be used as a full featured USB analyzer. Creating your own low, full, high, or experimental. Super speed USB device that provides a collection of n migin gateway that allows you to be easily create easily create USB device gateway software in a combination of the two. Building USB functionality into new or existing systems on a ship, uh, Luna is capable of generating custom peripherals and targeting common wishbone busts, allowing it to be easily integrated in SOC designs. The library provides simple automation for developments into stock. So I think it's written in, in my gen as well, which is kind of cool. Very nice. So that's that. I just wanted to mention that because um, she posted um, that the board was up and working. Um, we did Claire's post. Oh, the um, does everyone remember Glasgow? Uh, With well, the funding finished yes, last week. Um, uh, in case you didn't know, Timon here um, actually designed a case for it. That's the case that's being offered as part of the um, crowdsource. Uh, and he, he's just got some prototypes. It looks really cool. Um, I, I ordered the case as well with mine, which I thought was nice. The only thing missing here is he doesn't have the um, light pipes. Uh, but I'm sure those will come. So yeah, that's looking rather cool. Can't wait for that. We're not gonna actually going to see these until like May or something, though. I believe that was the uh, delivery schedule for Glasgow. Kind of looks different in its box. You can see the components there. Look. And that is aluminium, by the way, not uh, plastic milled aluminium and it's been anodized looking forward to that um okay some of these tabs don't need these now so that's the main thing the other thing we've got is what we're going to talk about today Laurie has been a very busy bee again in the last week um, Let me give you the URL for the PIO Verilog work that he's been doing, the FPGA Verilog, uh, FPGA PIO. There's the link. This is a site. He's also really added a nice um, readme as well now to get you started. I want to get down on this. Which is kind of cool. And he's got a nice little picture. There's some example programs, how to get running with it. It's now running on the black ice and the ULX3, I believe. And there's a nice little picture there here of driving um, some of the NeoPixel LEDs using a um, black ice, actually, which is kind of cool. So um, that's a nice little segue because we, what we're going to do is move on to part four. 
Um, so what I was going to do is not use the um, iStudio uh, this time, but just go directly into the um, source files themselves. Um, reason being is we get a clearer view on those and things have moved on somewhat. So I, I, last week I think we got up to the stage where we created most of small units or blocks, i.e. we had the X and Y scratch registers, we had two FIFOs, we had uh, a shifter that was used for both shift in and shift out. Or two versions that um two two instances of that we had the program counter um and then we were kind of moving on to the controller and i think we looked at some of the instructions um things have changed quite a bit in order to get it working properly so i guess the best thing to do is let's just review where we are so let's Let's start with uh, the scratch. Um, I hope this is going to work. Um, scratch. Let me get rid of the browser. Hold on. Just turn it off temporarily. We do not need to see that. So if I do scratch, what I want to be able to do here is Ooh, uh, can I do a compare? Compare with um, <laughs> power revisions. Uh, the last file revision for the scratch was first of the second year, so that was the one we were probably using last time. Oh, okay, so that opens a new window. No differences. Thirty first, first, thirty first, thirty first. I think it's just saying no. Um, no differences, is that right? Okay, let me just try one of us. Let, let me look at the program counter, see if that has changed. Compare with version that would have been last week. Okay, yeah, we're seeing something. Now, let me just see if I can change. Let me add a new. Um, Hmm. There we go. So here we can see the difference. Um, so what uh, Laurie has added in here is the wrap target support. Um, now, if you remember the conversation we had last time, uh, what the wrap target enables is um, it enables us to set the start wrap target. Yeah, so we can either um, we can either use the P end, which is the end position, or the wrap target to actually set the index. 
version. Hold on. I don't think Scratch has changed, Laurie is saying. Yeah, most of the others have. It just supports the wrap target directive. Yeah, I'm just reminding myself, Laurie, of what the wrap target did. So instead of us setting the P end, program endpoint, Ooh, so was were we setting that with PN before? Hold on. Oh, we were setting it to zero. Right. Okay. So instead of just setting it to zero, we're set, setting it to rack target, which is provided, which is the five bit address. Instruction pointer. So that's a fairly simple change. Hold on. Let me shut this. Okay, um, what happens then if I, should we look at next? Let's have a look at the uh, FIFO. No. Look at decoder, because that's changed as well. So second um, I don't think that's changed, Lori. Um So one of the things that you did change is the way that the divider part of the clock works, right? Um, decoder has changed so that the P enable is only set on rising edge of the clock divider. Yeah, so I'm going to have a look into the divider now because that has changed and affected several things. So let's just open that up. If I go back 7th, 4th, we were looking, I was probably looking at uh, 31st. Wow, there's a lot of changes here. <clears throat> I have to change this every time because it comes up in a new window, which is a bit annoying. Right, so um, obviously enable has now changed to a wire from a reg here um, the div counter has changed from a 32 bit to a 24 bit And we've got these other registers as well. So we've got the P enable, so that's the P clock enable, presumably. And we've got an old P enable. So I presume you're going to be doing some synchronization with this, comparing those two to get the edge right. So let's have a look, shall we? Yeah, if I look down, if we look down at the bottom here, um, what we've got going on is. Um, As long as this is less than 200 hex, I'm not quite sure what 200 hex is, um, or P enable and old PN. So it's comparing the current to the last state here, and only if they're different. So if pen is now high and the old pen was low, this is not the old pen, so that's high. So if both of those are effectively, um, so if that's high and it's low, that then this becomes true. Um, then this is enabled. I see. 
So this is to add edge, presumably 200 means a divider of 2.0. Oh right, because it was 1.0 because it's fractional before, wasn't it? 100 before. And you've changed that to be more representative of what actually goes on in the PIO. I believe, um, let's see if you remember you mentioning, sorry, that that's actually closer, that's what the numbers are inside the PIO. Or is that based on a 25 megahertz clock? Which is different again. Anyhow. So that's changed. So now you're saying here in the logic, um, if reset diff counter equals naught, that's the same. But p enable, well, it's now p n set to one. Um, otherwise, uh, obviously record what the last state of that was. Um, if this is normal. That's one, isn't it? Normal if clock divider less than two. So we set it to one else. Otherwise, the diff counter equals diff counter plus 256. We're jumping in 256 steps um, because it's fractional. Again, uh, if diff counter is greater than or equal to div minus 256, diff counter equals div counter minus div counter minus 256. And then we're shifting. So the difference here is we've changed pen for p enable. We've also changed the div minus one here to div minus two fifty six. That was probably just correcting our the calculation. Div counter not being set to naught, but being set to div counter minus div minus two fifty six. Div being, div being, there's div, the 24 bit input, the divider. So you've renamed that. No, that's the same. Okay. The old version didn't do fractional before. I thought it did. But I thought it was set at 100 rather than 200. It was a different type of fractional. Um, so that's that change there. Yeah, just got it wrong. Okay, so it's just corrected some mistakes as well. Nice one. What happens if I do another compare? So um, the other thing that's different, that's important here, is... Um, Laurie has changed from using a common shifter Verilog file module. My tea's gotten cold. To a um, to two separate ones. We've now got an output shift register and then an input shift register. Um, so I can't do a comparison to the old one. Um, I can show you on the screen though. So if we look at what's the, oh, it's not here, is it? Oh, I don't think they have a copy. Oh. Um, what did the old shifter look like? Hmm. I should have copied that. Okay, let's just look at them independently. So let's have a look at the output shift register. Um, so it's still 64 bit main register. Count is the same, still at 6 bits. Uh, the shift value is still the same at 6 bits. Do shift. And so we, we don't have um, shift value, do shift, and Right, so if we're going to do the shift, shift equals zero. So if it's zero, it's 32. Otherwise, it will be the value of shift. Because 32 is the maximum that this can go to. So that goes all the way around. Um, new shift, 
I think that was as it was before from memory. Uh, but it's a bit simpler now. Let's have a look at the synchronous stuff here. By the way, this stream will be slightly shorter probably today. Um, so I'm a bit more limited in time and we started late. Laurie saying current version appears to work. Um, so on reset, we reset obviously the shift register. We set the count to 32, which represents empty. Okay. Um, otherwise, we again look at the new P enable, which is edge based, uh, and we make sure that we're not stored. We can then do either a set. I don't think this has changed from before actually. So, um, if the direction is high, then we do basically a shift. Uh, of, we, we take the value into the shift register, the data in goes at the um, most significant uh, part of the 64-bit register, so the upper 32 bits, and then we put a 32 zeros effectively um, on the lower significant uh, half of the word. Otherwise, if the DIR is zero, we're shifting in the other direction. We're going to start things off differently. We're going to have a bunch of zeros and the most significant bits, and then the data um, set into the least significant bits. I don't seem to have the latest version. Um, hold on. Let me just do a pull. I thought I did a pull. Have you just changed it in the last few hours? Hold on. Apologies if that's the case. No, I don't want to roll it back. Hold on, this should. Uh, I thought that was the latest version, um, sorry, hold on, uh, where's my dialog gone, it's asking me to complete my pull, maybe it didn't complete, git pull failed, your local changes would be overwritten by the merge commit, ah, that's why, right, let me just roll back my changes, which I can do here, and then, um, Then I can do a pull. Apologies, um, Laurie, my bad. Uh, then I can do a pull. Hopefully it won't complain this time. Yay, that's better. 40 files updated in 16 commits. Significant stuff. Oh, right, does that mean that the other files I was just looking at have changed as well and I didn't go over them properly? That's an interesting point. Shout if that's the case and I'll revisit them. Um, let's have a... Well, uh, this is all new compared to before anyhow because it was a single shift before. Um, shift reg. Right, okay. This is very different. Yes, this is much better. Laurie thinks the others were okay, so we don't need to read. Right, so we've got a 32-bit shift register now, not a 64-bit, which is kind of cool. That's better. Uh, count still six bits, obviously. I've got some wires in here. So this is like a syntactical sugar for creating a new value, like an assign. Six bit. So the shift val equals shift. Sorry, if shift equals zero, it equals 32. Otherwise, it equals shift. 
which we saw in the last one um, the wire is 63 bit 64 bit so the shift 64 um, depending on the directory is either going to have the MSB for uh, a write I, when DR is high or it will be put in the least significant uh, part of the word if it's shifting in the other direction and because you're going from a um oh no, you're going from a 32 to a 64 why is it then shifting hmm. oh by the first vowel okay shift out uh, depending on direction, it's either going to be um, the least significant bits of the 64 bit shift register, which is then shifted by 32 minus whatever the shift vowel was, or otherwise it's going to be the upper bits and there's no shift, it's just a straight copy of bits. Um, new shift, depending on directory direction, is uh, either the upper 32 bits or the lower 32 bits. Okay, so slightly simpler now, a bit easier to read, I think. Uh, reset, that hasn't changed, same thing. We're resetting the shift reg and the count is to 32. Again, we're only doing this calculation, the setting and the shifting when we are not stored and p-enable the time. Now remember, p-enable in this time is going to be a positive edge based. Um, if set to begin, then we read the data input into the shift register directly. Remember, shift reg is now 32 bit, so there's no shifting uh, there. That, that's taken care of up here count is reset to zero otherwise if it's a do shift operation then the shift reg equals new shift which is this here that's like putting that here where the new shift is um, count goes up by the shift value um, and if that is greater than 32 no, sorry. If the count plus the shift shift value, the amount shifted is greater than 32, then it sets it at 32, which is the maximum. Otherwise, it's count plus the shift vowel. And then we've got some assignments down here. So the output is always uh, oh, so the output is only set when do shift is high. That wasn't there before. A shift out rather than shift reg. Oh, I see. So when do shift? Okay. So when do shift is high, we'll show shift out rather than shift reg. The output of the OSR, OSR is bit shifted out if a shift is active. Otherwise the, sh otherwise, the shift register is what Laurie is saying. So let me just read that again. The output of the output shift register is the bits shifted out if the shift is active. Otherwise, it's the shift register itself. So you can either take the shift register for contents or you can take the value of the shifted output. Okay, um, assign. Well, it was. What's that for, Laurie? Do you need to actually read the value of the shift reg rather than the shift outcome? Is that why you've got that? So that the state machine can read the shift register, but not. Ah, yes, it is the source of a move, etc. Okay, yeah. 
Okay, so you can read out the shift, current shift reg value and move it to somewhere else, right? Because you introduced a move command, which wasn't done before. Uh, the other one here, shift count, just always points to count. So that's a combinational assignment as well. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the uh, ISR. This is the input shift register. Again, the main register is a 32 bit. Um, shift file either equals 32 or the shift value coming in. The ISR always shift left, so there's no direction here. That's interesting. I think, yeah, remembering, uh, I don't. I think I've got this on the uh, something that may help here, guys. If I've got it, hold on. Let me see. We just bring the browser up because we can actually see Let me just change the browser window. Bear with me a sec, because it's picking up the wrong window now. Okay, so if we zoom in a bit, let me just find it and I'll show you because uh, under the oh MicroPython environment, no, it's not the one I want. It's not the one I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, damn, Raspberry Pi data sheet. They're all gone. I split these up. Hold on just a moment. Um, where the hell do I put that? The ISR always shifts less. I may be wrong about that. Well, hold on, Larry, because I remember seeing something. How do I open this bloody? Uh, let's find it again from Raspberry Pi. Hi, Pico getting started. Uh, board specifications, data sheet. Probably already downloaded this. Um, so if I find this, there are some diagrams in here that were interesting. Oh, this is the wrong data sheet. Shit. Excuse my French. Do excuse me. Helps if I would uh, download RP2040 data sheet. That's what we want. There's a nice little couple of diagrams in here, actually. Whether they're actually correct representation or not is another question. But I do recall seeing, here we go. Um, let me just bring that across so you guys can see it. So this is the output shift register. Yeah, which indicates the direction of shift, but it doesn't. That doesn't indicate direction here. 
The OSR fills with zeros as each data is shifted out. Section 3.4.2. If you look at that diagram, it doesn't seem to indicate that it does uh, both directions. But so if we look at the this shifter, that doesn't look like it goes the other way around in the diagram. Hold on, you can't see it, can you? Input shift register data enters one to thirty-two bits at a time. The current content is shifted left or right to make room. Once full, contents are written to the RX five O. Shift direction is configurable by the process of our configuration best jump. So yeah, it's saying it can be configured to be either way. Just like the output shift register. Shift direction can be left right configurable by a processor. <sighs> I was thinking maybe you were right, but obviously reading that, it's capable of doing um, both directions. Um, you just haven't implemented it in the ISR, the input shift register yet. The rest is pretty much the same. We're setting this to zero, obviously, rather than 32, which we're doing by default in the output shift register. Um, um, setting, well, that's the same as before. So if, if we get a set, a set signal, we uh, just read from the data input. Uh, count, we set the bit count, bit count, bit count. Which is a six bit input. Otherwise we do shift, shift itself is just read the upper bits from the next value. So you've called it next value here. slightly different naming um, the next value is high key so it's a concatenation of the shift reg uh, in the upper significant bits and then the lower significant bits are calculated from D in now, what? Calculated 32 minus the shift vowel shifted left by D in. Oh, that's, sorry guys. Let me turn the silly browser off. My bad. Uh, so what I'm talking about is this here. Next vowel. With the 64 bit register, so, so it's saying it's a concatenation of the shift register in the most significant bits position, and then the least significant bits of this are 32 minus shift valve, but that itself is shifted by D in. So the amount that that shifted in comes in through data in, you're reusing the data in. Is that right? And then that whole thing is shifted by uh, the shift vowel number of bits. I'm just trying to get this D in bit. Left align input value and concatenate it with the shift register to produce a 64 bit value it's 
It's a D in bit I don't get. Oh yes, because you're shifting it round. Right, okay. Wow, yeah. Count. Okay, so the count. Uh, again, if the count plus the shift fell is over 32, then it's 32 because it's capped there. Otherwise, it's count plus the shift fell. Uh, D out is just whatever the shift register is. Shift count is whatever the count is. So these are just combinational. They're like wires connected to these. Hmm, cool. Okay. Um, did you change the? Uh, hmm, should we look at the FIFO next or the uh, PIO? I think the PIO, but this is probably going to be a large change, isn't it? Let me just look at the diff uh, from the seventh four four four. four second there's probably going to be a lot of stuff here okay not too bad let me just um change what we're looking at so if we're looking at the pio now the pio won't necessarily remember this from last time this was the code the PIO file in this case, in Laurie's code, actually holds um, what we envisaged. No, it's not PIO I want to have a look at. Sorry. It's the machine that we wanted to have a look at. But this might be rather a lot. Might want to do the FIFOs first because they'd be smaller. Hold on, compare with. Oh, crikey, there's a lot. Seven, seven, six, six. Ooh, crumbs. Yes, we're going back a bit here. Massive changes. There's a lot to go through here. Um, let's look at the FIFOs first. Um, oh, these haven't changed since the first. Okay, the FIFOs haven't changed yet. However, there is an issue with them. Um, let me just mention that briefly. There is a possible issue with the FIFOs here because in this setup here, we can only do pull if we're not doing a push. And that's not necessarily the case because the two could actually overlap. But accounting for that is actually quite tricky. Um, we did hit some issues. Um, Laurie and I were talking in the week and um, having some problems when he was using the UART example. Um, let me see if I can open the UART. In fact, let's do that afterwards. Let's look at the other chain. Well, yeah, let's look at the other changes. Let's do the big bit, which is the machine side. So this is the code that would have gone in the what was the controller block in iStudio. Um, there's a lot of changes here. We just go through them piece by piece because this includes all the new instructions, among other things. Oh, then let me just check the dates here. Yeah, I think I've got the dates right here. So let's start at the top and work our way down, see if we can make sense of these changes. Let me bring them up on the screen. Uh, 
Right. Uh, I can probably make this a bit wider, can I? Everyone see that? So first one, uh, we don't just have an exec anymore. We have an exec one. This change is to do, we'll, we'll hit this in a minute because exec was not actually, the exec instruction was not actually done when we looked at the code last week. Not that we'd actually gone down the list of um, instructions at that point. We'd only got as far, I think, as jump and wait. Um, so now here you've got uh, a new register called auto. We'll find out what that is in a minute. Um, and this is a local register. What have we changed on the inputs? Uh, you've made the D out register a register rather than a wire to give it some state. And you're questioning the need for pins in counts. You also added the wrap target, which we saw earlier, the five bit wrap target. Okay, moving down. What have we got here? PIO output pins, PI, pin zero output pins, sorry. Auto is set when auto pull or auto push is active. There we go. So that's support for auto basically. Um, but here what we're looking at, pin zero equals output pin zero specifically. Um, don't know what it's for yet. Let's have a look. Uh, there's been some changes here. <laughs> yes, we've got our wire called null. Um, <laughs> And there's a comment by it to indicate what that means, which is cool. And what have we got going on here? So ISR count and OSR count. Um, we've got a bunch of pin functions inserted here. Pin zero, etc., are only to help in GTK Wave, so that you can have a look at them makes it easier to look at the output pin waveform right okay so what Laurie is saying there is that's really when you're running the simulation um you want to be able to see one of the pins on the output so he's put that in there specifically so that we can see on the simulation if we need to um so what have we added here so we've got uh 31 in pins, 32 bit in pins, sorry, uh, in an assignment here, which is combinational, which is the input pins shifted by the pins in base. Sorry, the pins in base shifted by the number of input pins. Otherwise, that's to save you opening a big array and having to scroll right down, apparently. Um, okay. Uh, values for use GTK wave. So that's these are just things that he can look at, or we can look at in the simulation. Um, those four, this bit's the same, and then we've got here states wire enabled equals exec one or imm what's imm stand for yeah uh Norris just saying pins in base is the base for in pin group like which pin it points to to start the group of pins um what does uh, imm stand for remind me nori immediate or something immediate execution right okay um so what we're saying here is so this is controlling things like the clock and stuff and the enable of the various parts of the state machine so um basically if any of these are 
a high because this is an or. Um, so if exec one is high, it's doing exec, or if immediate execution is high, or if en and p enable is high, which is the clock edge logic. Instructions enabled, and then while delaying, that's only the case if delay count is greater than zero. Okay, um, and delay in this case is what's used in the instructions or instruction. Comment. What have we got here? What? You can execute an immediate instruction even when the machine is not enabled. That's just a single instruction. Okay, because it's combinational or uses just a combinational. Um, free bit op equals in bit op equals in so the case where op is equal to free bit op equals in so what do we have before so that is the same as this That is just to cover all cases for combinational logic because it's two bits. Right. OP, I remember. No, it's OP. Yeah, no, it's three bits. But that doesn't cover all the combinations, does it? Isn't there eight different possibilities rather than four? Because OP is three bits, right? OP is the parameter. Oh, I've got a naming issue. I'm missing that. This is passed in. Yeah, sorry. My bad. So that's a locally scoped OP inside the function, not the global one. Right, which obviously only has, so there can only be four combinations. Okay, cool. Um, and this function is used uh, as is this function. These are used in combination later on. Um, Let's just skip over that for the moment. So obviously there was some clock changes here. Um, the top three is reversed. Okay. So um, we've now the exec here. Do execution on to so change that. So whereas before it was exec one equals exec. And you put a note in here to explain that. Ah, first of all, you've corrected this if and this if. So if we're doing reset or restart, then we don't go into this. That was clearly a, a bug here because we could have gone into this if those weren't set, if those were set. Um, whereas because we put the else here, this only gets executed if this isn't the case, i.e. neither of those are high. Um, so there's a fix there, and then you've added this um, comment which basically says do execution on the next cycle after exec set. Yeah, because we're in a piece of synchronous logic here. So after the clock, these things will be updated. 
Uh, exec one instruction becomes equal to exec instruction. So that's that's a, that's the uh, the older version of this. Just as that is the older version of that. Way one cycle behind. Um, if delay count is greater than zero here, but now you're saying if delaying, delaying. Where's delaying come from? Ah, so we that that was this change here. So that's just a shorthand labeling for what it was before. So it's not actually changed the logic. But presumably you're using that somewhere else again. Which is why you wanted to turn that into um into a labeled piece of combination. And here we've got another difference in this line. Did I disconnect and reconnect there? My chat connected and disconnected for some reason. I hope I didn't drop the channel. Uh, it dropped the steam. So waiting and exec. Ah, uh, you've added in this condition and delay is greater than zero. Couldn't you use delaying there um, instead of that? You've already got that. You've already reused it. Oh, it's delay count. Okay, that's different. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Delay count becomes equal to delay. Right, so if we're not waiting, we're not executing, and delay is greater than naught, then we set the delay count if we read in from delay. So in other words, if there's a legitimate delay value and the other things aren't happening, we load it in. And change it cool um, put to do here which is interesting move this to PIO and merge output values from machines right I haven't said anything about PIOs yet um, I'm conscious of that there is something higher than the state machine here uh, there's a separate piece of Verilog that actually configures the state machine to get it going etc uh, which I haven't even touched on yet in the previous uh, parts. Okay, so what's changed here? So we've gone from enable and p enable to enabled and delaying. So this is again a synchronous section to do with setting the I/O direction uh, and pins. So what we're saying here is rather than that being gated on the enable and p enable, this is enabled and delaying. Let's just remind ourselves. Enabled, which includes the en and penable, plus immediate instruction or running the exec one. So that's fine. So that's just replaced it. So this operates in both those modes as well i execution immediate and then the, and it's not delaying which we didn't we weren't taking care of in this previous version here we weren't allowing for that so that prevents this so if, if, if a delay if we're in a delay we shouldn't be updating this the pins basically and there's a note here to do set mask to allow multiplex of results from multiple machines. Okay, it's a more complicated bit. Most of what's working so far, certainly when I've talked to Laurie, um, this has been confined to single state machines rather than the four state machines working cooperatively together. That's correct, isn't it, Laurie? That hasn't changed in this implementation. Let me know if that has. How are we doing for time? Crikey, it's when it's done. Yes, correct. So it's just single state machine stuff. Um, so that note is very relevant here. When we go on to um, dealing with multiple state machines, we have to mux pins from the different state machines. 
Um, what else has changed here? Side set enabled, and you're saying auto and not waiting. Oh, well, not auto and not waiting. Auto, right. Multiple machines partly implemented but not tested. And that pin code needs adding. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to understand the auto and waiting part. So this is to do with the new auto pull and auto push. So if that's enabled and nothing's waiting. Prevents this doesn't set the pin side count. Is that correct? That code needs improving. Okay. Right. So moving down, what have we got here? Uh, we're zeroing out the auto. Remember, this section is really just making a default for all the things that will change um in this um combinational part that executes the instructions reason for doing that is to prevent the synthesis and or simulator uh, inferring latches um, because that would have a very different operation to what what's required and you've added another one here the irq flags out because the irq stuff has been added uh, D out, you've added that, zeroing the D out. Was that just missed out before? Yeah, this is painful to have to manually check that you've got all of these in here. I've always thought it would be nice to have a, an instruction that does this for you. It automatically zeroes anything you use in here that could change. But, yeah. Um, so what else is happening? Um, the begin and end structure has changed here. Hold on. You don't need it because you've lost the if. There it was just begin and now you've got, oh, so you've added this in. Right, to make sure these are, are only executed a when it's enabled and when it's not in a delay okay so just gating on that at least one of those was found by next pnr when i started doing synthesis all yeah, right that's good oh it, yeah well it, yeah, i'm seem to remember it used to be an option that you could pass on the um, command line but I think Dave David made that default i.e. to notify you I remember having a conversation with Dave about it because I always said to him this is a really useful function to know when you are inferring latches because often you don't want that to happen um right so um this code looks the same you've got a note here yeah so the op1 part of this instruction remember we're processing or about to execute the jump in execution well this has a condition associated with it which is um decoded as op1 from the instruction iverilog doesn't tell you about latches that's right Quite possibly, unless there's an option, command line option for it or something that we're unaware of, Laurie. You mean by default it doesn't? Um, jump one, I don't know if Ferrolator does as well. Jump one, jump of me, and dumb. Any of those changed? Hold on, there is a, is there a change here. Yes. So before you were saying decrement x is 1 when the condition is x is not equal to 0. But now you're saying it's decrement x equals x not equal to 0. 
because this is a separate instruction. Because otherwise you'd be setting decrement x to 1 even when that wasn't the case. Uh, I don't decrement x after 0. I think going negative was wrong. Okay, the same here. This is just the same version, but for the Y scratch. So again, good bug fixes. Uh, what's it saying? Source. Oh, so you put some kind of comments on what this is representing. So this is rep representing the source of the weight. Um, what's changed here? Ah, so condition one, weighting equals input input pins and um, pins in base plus op2 rather than op2 so that's probably just a bug um not been equal to op2 cool um then wait what have you got here so What's changed here? Um, so in has changed. So this was as before, but you've added here, if auto push and ISR count is greater than or equal to ISR threshold, then you're doing something extra here before decoding the source. Implementation of auto pull and auto push. Okay, yeah, so you're just taking the push line high. Um, you're placing your in shift in the on the D out to the shifter. Uh, you're resetting your new value. Um, do that. Yeah. Uh, bit count you're resetting. And you're set shift in to not full and waiting to full. Okay. Auto push whenever the shift reaches a threshold, you pull. That's this one. Auto push. Shift to push. I want to push. Okay. Yeah. So for auto push, whenever the shifter reaches a threshold, you push. Otherwise, this other stuff for in is the same, although in pens, new value because in pins. What did it equal before? Input pins. What's the difference between input pins and in pins? Now I'm confused. In pins. Got one of these that we changed.
Ah, oh, here we go. Ah, uh, yeah. So in pins is actually the input pin is the pins in base shifted by input pins. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, a bit slow there. I forgot about that. So that's changed. Is anything else on the input side changed? No. So let's move on to out. So out here. Why is my view changed? Why can't I see what I was seeing before? The linking side by side viewer. What have I changed here? So out, we've added this other case for the auto pull, obviously, which wasn't in the um, here. Plus, you've added a label for destination. Um, so if auto pull and OSR client is output shift register count is greater than output shift register or equal to output shift register threshold, then it does a automatic pull. So pull equals one, new value equals data in, set shift out equals uh, empty, not empty, sorry. Waiting was empty and auto equals one. So you're doing the same thing you're doing up here, but you've got it in a nice long line there, and this is more vertical. This is formatted differently, but similar logic. Right, push, 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 push. It's changed here. Push. Okay, we've got a whole load of changes here. So the original push was, if not, uh, operand two. Sorry, if not, the third bit of operand two, begin push. Oh yes, so the operand one bit two determines whether it's push or pull. If I remember rightly, because they share the same instruction, push and pull. Uh, they're only differentiated by one of the lower order bits. Uh, begin push equals one. Do shift equals one. Da, da, da. So what are we changing here? So now we're saying obviously that means if it's a push instruction, um, to do no op when auto push, that's not done. Okay, so let's just look at this logic. So on the push here, if begin push equals one, do and shift one. Why is this showing the numbers here? This is really annoying. It wasn't doing that before. Gently change my view side by side viewer. Not no collapse unchanged pieces because we're still going through them. Clearly getting tired here. So back to push. So what we're now doing, we're looking at, uh, oh, wait a Laurie's saying something. Set shift out should not be, not, not have been set while waiting. Better way of doing this is probably to stall the shifters when waiting. I had an implementation of 
if full. Um, oh, I see. This is this is the if full bit. So this is the new bit. That is pretty much as was before. But because if we look at that, else pull begin left shift waiting equals zero, not empty. So this is slightly different. We're looking at full, which is the opposite of empty anyhow. Okay. Ooh, this is getting harder to read. Sorry, folks. And also the pull push equals one. So that was a typo. It said push equals one. I guess. Some of the logic could be simplified here, yeah, possibly. Um, but let's just look at this. So is full. So if ISR count, create an ISR threshold, push equals one, do that and shift. Uh, set shift in equals. So it's and it with full now. New value for zero waiting equals OP10 and full. I forget what OP10 is without looking at the instruction chart. Okay, and then we're on to moves. Oh, a minute. Oh no, there's a lot more here to this push. Crikey. I've added in here to do no up and no pull. If OP11, the OSR count is greater than the OSR threshold rather than the ISR up here. Oh, right. Um, it's a bit repetitive. OP10 is blocking. Added implementations of if empty, which is this one here. Um, so if empty, so begin, this is blocking value, pull equals one, set shift, now not equal to empty new value, because data in, waiting, it's end of, else, if empty, copy x to the OSR. So we're copying from the scratch register x to the output shift register. New value equals x. Yeah. Set shift out equals 1. Otherwise, uh, pull equals one, new value equals data in and shift equals data out. Okay, there's quite a lot there. And then what's this? This is blocking, but this is the, um, so that's the pull empty. This is blocking pull equals one. So this is a repeat of that logic. Pull value if available. This looks identical to that logic. Wow. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. That looks identical to this. Yeah. 
but so this is if empty what is this then if it's not empty if it's previous logic only done when threshold reached yeah Yeah, maybe you can turn this repeated bit into um, an assignment. Cause it's all combinational. See, that's all combinational and that's kind of a repeat of it up here. You could probably turn that into an assignment, uh, Laurie make it more readable then because you're just repeating it here yeah just be easier to read then because you forget where you are because you're in so many indents and so many if and else's okay so move let's have a look at move uh why have i lost my it's because these bits are so shifted that it, my display is not able to um, to show the whole chunk. So the move move case op1. So the big changes here for move are all right to do so destination status source. Let's have a look. Case zero. In end pins that's not implemented, I guess. So in the case of uh, where the operand, second part of the operand is, um, or three bits of the second operand, in the case when it's zero, move value, peak force, bit up. Added pins as source for all the destinations, Laurie is saying. Added pins as source for all the destinations. Ooh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So we're moving. Getting past the English on this. Added pins as a source for all of the destinations. In other words, the state of the pins. Move pins X, etc. Uh, hmm. Okay, so th these two are identical, I noticed, but obviously, uh, one's from the respect of the uh. Uh, one's one's for the X scratch register, the others for the Y scratch register. Um, but the sources, okay, yeah. What did we have before? Yeah, there's a lot more. Okay. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. So what we're saying is we're taking them from, hold on, the new value becomes equal to um, the option in pins, not free. That's the pin selection. Set x equal 1. Otherwise, we set y equals 1. Right, so each one of these is individually different. Look, no. Shift in, out, shift. And that's repeated with the results setting the Y register. So one of the registers acts as the uh, comparison. Whoa, okay. Um, and then you've got the exec, which we didn't have. So case of P2 exec. Exact instruction equals bit op. These pins. Yeah, the bit op thing is quite oh, quirky. I've got to try and remember this. Maybe a bit later tonight we'll be doing this. This is the, that set of functions at the top, isn't it? Bit op. So bit op. Input in. Input. Turns bit up. Some functions or tasks could simplify some of that. Bit up is for, and then you're going to say something. Um, bit operation. Move x, not pins. Or move x colon colon pins. So one is the reverse value of pins. The other is the negation and reversal, depending on the uh, op value. The op value determines what happens. Okay, Luke Wren's DVIO code uses that for a lot. Rex pins. I wonder what it's based on. So, what's the colon colon pins as is basically? Negation and reversal. Okay. And it sets the X and Y at the end of it. No, it activates the setting of those registers. And then here, it's just directly executing the instruction. And then in these ones, These are for calculations for the jump. No, not calculations for the jump. Setting jump to one. Why is it setting the PC? So it's doing a move to the PC. Is that what these are doing? These are moving data directly into the PC. And the pins. Sorry. To execute the instructions. Instruction. Um, and then the shift register in. 
Executing instructions from pins would be interesting, yeah, it would. Open to all sorts of abuse, of course. Um, and then you've got your ISR bits and the OSR, and I haven't done much on these. Um, so those could be used as part of the move as well. Um, shift in, set shift out. Again, these could be useful interactive elements between the state machine and stuff. Yeah, so much on here to play around with. I mean, unbelievable. Um, is that all of our moves? Yes. Okay, and then we're looking at the IRQs. And what are you doing here on the IRQs? Because I know you did some of the basic IRQ stuff with OP1. IRQ flags out, IRQ index equals zero, so it resets it else. IRQ flags out, IRQ index gets set to one. Waiting. Uh, so that's combinationally determined if IP1 is zero. Sorry, oh, the, the zero bit of operand one is ended with the IRQ flag, IRQ index. So if they're both one, and that's not equal to naught, then we're waiting. If either one of those is negative, well, if, I want, if that is positive and that is positive, then the output. And <laughs> that is one, and that is one, then it won't be equal to zero. So waiting will be zero. Zero, not equal to zero. One, no, if one, it's not equal. So waiting, so it'll only be waiting if that is one and this is one. Uh, and then we've got, one minute. OP one zero often means blocking. Okay. Uh, and then the set example. Um, set set pins equal to one. One uh, in the case of one, it's set x equal to one. New value to. Uh, so that's 27 zeros followed by the second operand and the same for um, this one set we're setting y rather than x so we're writing to x or we're setting x to 27 digits plus whatever the uh, op2 value is in the LSB that's it, that's all the commands. Blimey, that's hard. Um, then what we go on to down here is, uh, remember last week when I spoke about, we were trying to represent the logic for the instruction execution as a block called controller, which also had a separate encoder, etc. But here, this Verilog file or module that we're looking at is the state machine itself. So it includes the controller, but it also contains all the instantiation of its sub module scratch register X, scratch register Y. Um, program counter. The output shift register and the input shift register. and its own decoder. So these are all children of this module. Or, yeah, children. Children instances of this module. So for every one of these machines, you get this whole set. Um, so there's actually some changes here. So you may decoder a child, which it wasn't before. 
the clock divider should the, should it have its own clock divider Laurie or is the clock divider common to all of them I guess no I guess each one has its own clock divider because it could be working at a different uh, fractional rate to the others so I am being daft so the clock dividers here the decoder has been added its own separate instruction decoder that wasn't there before so that's what's changed here so it now has its own decoder so each state machine has its own decoder because it creates its own set of um, decoding instructions which was different for the, the stuff that I was working on I had that included in the state machine so it was automatically done but yeah okay um, just move the position of the decoder it was there before okay so you just shuffled things around um, what's changed on here so the PC the program counter here we've changed our link to drive the stored um, was waiting or immediate instruction or when the delay is greater than zero and delay count not equal to one has now been changed to waiting or auto or oh yeah because we had it in auto that wasn't there before um, we also didn't have the execution stuff so that's been added in and then this delaying logic is worked out from the assignments above the combination of the assignments above so we don't need to manually work that out that makes it more readable which is good you've also passed in the wrap target which wasn't there before to allow it to wrap on a machine basis state machine basis uh scratch x what's changed here then okay so enable now which actually represents pretty much the same as Ian and Pinable but the clock head version of that positive edge version of that um, delay count well being above zero that's now represented by delay because there is the assignment above that already does that so we've got a new label for that Um, same for the Y register decoder here. So you've just moved it, so that's where the decoder was before. The shifter now we, we had two shifters before on the old one because they were a common module. Now these are separate, completely separate modules. So we've got the input shift register instance then the output shift register um, the rest is much part for part I mean we've got delaying instead of delay count greater than zero but again that's just using the assignment above to replace it and those are the major changes blimey that was a lot to go through How are we doing for time? God, it's 20 past 10. I might just have to call it a day. Um, is there anything you want me to point out? Oh, wait a minute. PC now advanced before delay. Okay. Anything you want me to cover before I finish off here today, um, Laurie? Anything I've missed that's important? We should be pretty much up to date now. I know we haven't covered the PIO bits. Uh, I was thinking we could do that when we look at the um, simulations. I mean, we could run the simulation. Is it worth looking at the simulation? Oh, I was going to mention. Um, yeah, the PIO has changed a lot, but I didn't show that to start with anyhow, Laurie. So. Um, I guess let's have a look at the PIO okay so up above this because remember that that one state machine is just one instance now you need something that replicates that four times or eight times if you're doing both sides 
as well as all the FIFOs, and you need something that owns the FIFOs as well. Um, and something that actually configures the state machine in the first place. So that's the job of what um, Laurie here has created called the PIO um, Verilog file or Verilog module. Um, so Laurie's saying, have you time to show a simulation or something running on black ice? Uh, what do you think would be best? I mean, I could show it running on black ice, but there's not really much to see, is there? And I'd probably need to explain it before I show it anything else. Um, let me just cover the PIO a little bit first, sorry, so that they understand. Um, so what the PIO is doing is it's controlling the, um, it's setting up and controlling the state machine. So one of the things it does is it creates multiple versions of them. So one of the inputs here you'll see that comes from the test setup. Um, uh, is the M index, which is the machine index, which is a two bit code which can have four different independent indexed machines. Um, Nori's saying the PIO configuration should probably be changed to use the PIO registers, possibly. Uh, let me just quickly go through here. Um, so first, if there is a memory for all those instructions. Remember, the program counter is pulling out the instructions that are being decoded. Um, that has to live somewhere. So here we've set up um, some memory. In fact, in fact, this is a each instruction is 16 bit, okay, and we have 32 instructions total in our memory, which is shared between all the state machines. Um, as it says here, shared instruction menu. Um, oh, do I want to go through all of these individually or just do something? These are local actions that are run from the test bench. Um, here's the main right so before we go into that so it, th there is a state machine here effectively or an action machine if you like that tells it what to do which enables you to go through these different states of preparing the PIO and then running etc we'll come back to that in a sec but more importantly um, if we look down here this is where we actually generate um, the state machines themselves. Now in Verilog, if you're not familiar with this, this may look a bit weird, because you're seeing this here and you're saying, well, there's a for loop here. So is that going through stuff at runtime or in the synthesis? You know, is that gates? Well, the answer to that is no, because what we've got here is, you know, a generate section is really just a programmatical way of creating, uh, repeating. So what we're saying is run this, you know, create this stuff in the synthesis below um, four times. So this is really generative stuff. It just saves you writing it four times. It's not logic that runs inside the Verilog itself, inside the synthesis itself. So it's taking, so it's actually making four of these machine instances. And then we've got all of this stuff which is the IO. The other thing this is responsible for doing uh, uh, is creating instances of a TX and RX FIFO for each of the state machines. If you remember on the diagrams, um, let me see if I can bring that up actually, that might help visualize what's going on here. Um, if 
I go back to that big diagram, you can see the parts here that we're talking about. So here's each state machine that's being created, one of four. That's what's in the for loop, that generating for loop. And then each one has a TX and an RX FIFO associated with it. So what the PIO is doing is it's controlling this. It's also controlling some of the IO mappings as well. So the PIO could be thought of like the bigger picture here, as well as holding the memories. So the PIO is like looking at this diagram in many ways. Um, so the RP2040 version has an address and a data peripheral bus interface. I have action index and M index in place of address. That's for setting stuff in. Yeah, he's talking about what Louis talking about is how the data gets in here. So when you're doing a test bench or a simulation, you need to get the data in to set the program out, to set the uh, instruction memory up, etc. So where you, on the left hand side here on this diagram, you have the AHB light bus, which is the uh, the the bus inside the um, RP2040 itself, which is attached, obviously, to the processors and other peripherals. Um, so normally you'd run instructions on one or other of those cores or DMAs in order to get information to and from the FIFOs and get your um, uh, instructions into the instruction memory as well. Plus, you've also got your IRQs and things as well. Um, the RP2040 can optionally join the FIFOs together. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So these FIFOs have four 32-bit spaces in them. But what you can do, so if you know that you're only going to be TXing or RXing between the bus and the state machine, uh, you could join those two together to give you twice the capacity. Uh, and uh, Laurie's saying he hasn't worked out how to do that yet. Uh, that that that's really a configuration for the uh, FIFO. Um, I should make my interface more like the AHB light bus. Well, it doesn't matter what you use. It doesn't have to be AHB. It could be. A wishbone or something like that it depends what you want to interface it to Laurie what do you um, what are you using for your VEX risk setup it, oh are you going to be combining it with the VEX risk to start with if so what bus are you using with the VEX risk isn't that a, the, a proprietary thing like banana bus or something or are you actually using a wishbone or might add it to Saxon sock vex yeah but what 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 does the Saxon sock um use is it a, the proprietary yeah the banana bus or whatever it's called or bmb use bmb of the apb what bmb of the apb peripheral bus what's bmb So you saying that the Saxon SOC, SOC has a APB or oh, BMB or APB, yeah. Well, I don't know which you're using. Maybe you have two different versions that use two different things. But yeah, a way of connecting it up will be good. If, if you're intending using it in a kind of SOC scenario where you've got your soft core. Um, and again, even if you're using something external, a bus might be a good idea even if you're just writing to it from say an external uh, CPU uh, via SPI or called SPI or memory address or whatever you may still put a bus in between particularly if you want to use it internally as well as externally we've got a friend friend but in any case I should use an address interface yeah well that can come later once you've got the test stuff working 
and you're happy with that then you can look at adding that part in and making the registers similar to the RP2040 but for the moment the PIO is acting like this diagram only it isn't an AHP light bus or anything like that it's just basically set up to be able to take actions from a test bench or something similar in order to operate um, what about running a simulation quickly what would be the best one to do to have a look at um, rather than the trouble is if we run it on black ice all you either see is a couple of LEDs that are on or the output from a serial which is what was in the test bench to start with um, we could run a simulation that might be more interesting UART TX is quite a good simulation. Should we have a quick look at that then? Uh, what command do I need to run? Um, remind me. Um, so is it to uh, make sim or something? Hold on. I should look at the website. No, what does it say? CD FPGIO. I need to change into the sim directory, right? Let's do that. Um, make sim tbuartx. Cribbing it from your um, readme. Hey. Uh, hmm. Hold on. Copy. Paste. Right, let me type it manually because copy and paste isn't working. Make uh, sim and what was it? TB equals you at test bench equals you at underscore TX you at underscore TX. Oh, hold on. Not enough words in the file for the requested range. Let the cat out. She just wanted something to eat. Um. warning is not a problem okay so now if I run to so where am I mount username right so if I run GTK bear with me uh, I just need to get a PowerShell up to run this because otherwise I forget where it is Does it always put the wave file in the same place? Because I'm using the same thing that I was before. Let me get the um, GTK up. Uh, let's put this in front of the stuff so that we can see it. Bit big. Let's make it smaller. Okay. You open PIO and the machine one. Okay, so let's open the test bed. PIO instruction machine one. So what do I want to open in machine one? All of the um things. 
Um, yeah, there's quite a bit of decoder instruction. Uh, what do we want to look at? Just click on machine one. Okay. Can I move all of these in? That's rather a lot. Uh, let me just zoom out. So at the top we've got the uh, clock. Um, where is our enable? Probably a good thing to look at, right? Because that's where the action starts. Depending on the positive of the, is it enable? Oh, I can't see that in here. Um, oh, we've got enable. Because all the red ones here are just unknown states, aren't they? They haven't been set at this point, so there's very little going on. Oh, maybe I didn't go for long enough. 200. It's only 200 nanoseconds. Is there not enough time for it to do anything in 200 nanoseconds? No. Pressing zoom fit. Zoom fit. Hmm. Oh, set that one. So that's 200 nanoseconds. Next to plus. Yeah. So I see a reset. I see, ah, there's the P clock. Hmm. Are you using P clock? Program start, zero. That's all I'm seeing. Should I be seeing more than this? A greater period of time. Pin zero. Where's our pin zero? Um, the file I'm looking at is under source waves.bcd. Is that the right place to look? Or is it storing it somewhere else? Is it the right file, Laurie? So the output from the simulation, does that go into uh, a waves.vcd file under source? Hmm. Twinkle, how can we help you? What? 
Mm-hmm. You can say hello. Are you after food? Mm-hmm. Say hello to the folks. You've just had some of your food, haven't you? Hey? Just in your tension, so do you want to go out? <laughs> hmm? You want to go back through there? I don't think you know what you want. I don't think she knows what she wants. <laughs> um, yeah, why aren't I seeing that? I think you have an old file. I just want to check that that is the right path for the file forward slash source forward slash waves dot VCD. Is that what it outputs to? Hold on. Hmm. Waves.vcd. Let's have a look. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, there is a local one in the sim directory. Maybe that's what I should be looking at. Oh, right. Okay. Hold on. That will be why then we are looking at an old file. Let me just open. Hold on. How close is this? Attention deficit, that's what it is. That's not what that is. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, hold on, I'm opening the wrong file here. Oh, Let's get back to where we are. Uh, this looks better. Machine machine zero or machine one, machine zero. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, oh, that's better. We've actually got something now. Let's just move that down a bit. Oh, I can't move it any further that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can I close this? No. It's annoying. Right, what should we be looking at? What did you say? Um, pin zero. Pin zero, pin zero, pin zero, pin zero, pin zero. Why can't I see it? There. Uh, I don't see much there. Have I fit? 70 microseconds. Oh, I've got in pin zero. Um, right, sorry, my bad. There we go. Pin zero. So this is the UART output. Can I um hold on data format? Ask him. Can I do that? Let it decode. Uh, 
Um, is there a way to decode that um, in GTK? I forget. I've got new C's in the logic analyzer now. So I can definitely see that there's data there. So what? let's remind ourselves that should be counting up, right, from zero. Um, 30 then goes high, then 31 goes high, etc. First high is the free of free zero. Okay. The significant bit first. Uh, let's zoom in. So you're talking about this here. My thing just disconnected and reconnected. Hopefully the stream didn't. So that's the first bit is what you're saying. Is that one? Hold on, let me just zoom out a bit more. I can see a frame. That's one. That's two. Oh no. Two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After it goes low, you get 30. On P end. Uh, let's remind ourselves. Sorry, let me just switch back briefly because it would help if people could actually see what we're sending. So free zero is the start value, right? Because it's um, ASCII. Let me just um, quickly switch back. Uh, what we need to look at is the data for the UART. Hold on. Oh, not that one. What did you call it? Top. Okay, hello, the URTX mem. No, I don't want that. URTX.v. So it loads in the program. Okay. And the configuration, but then what it does, so it sends the program to the PIO, 
then it does the configuration and this is where it generates the input so it's generating the data that's going into um, into the D, into the FIFOs so it starts off with that's the push and it has this state variable which it adds one to um, if that gets to 10 let's see so when it gets up to 10 it resets um, so what it's doing so CP is counting from 0 through to 10 right or is it 1 through to 10 and that's being combined with the offset for the zero character so we should see 30 31 etc is what we're already seeing so we go back to the gtk and we look at uh, data in why can't I see it off the page D in there, okay. Okie dokie. So if we go to right, oops, wrong way. So if we scroll to here, we see data in change. So we're going zero three zero zero three one three two. Three, 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 four. So if we look at that first change here, that's where it transitions from 30 to 31. Damn it. You need to learn how to drive GTK wave. It's not going to where I want it to. And then, oh, of course, it's scrolled down here. I can't see it. And there's pin zero. So that's the end. Is that the end? No, because there's the delay. Shame we haven't got a decoder for that. There's so many signals, it's difficult to pick out. Um, but it's got to work its way through the system as well. We need to look at where there's a, we need to look at the pull, etc. Is there a way of doing the decode? Bits to real, real to bits. I thought there was a way of telling this to. Um, does this only work when it's parallel? Can't do ASCII. Hmm. That's a shame. Let 
this translate field process, but I don't know quite how to do that. Yeah, I don't, don't have that plugged in. Okay, I mean, yeah, can I clear this? Hold on. Can I get rid of those? Maybe. Cut. So let's do it one at a time. So we need uh, data in. And we need um, APIO zero. Do we need pull and push? Hold on. And then um, P zero. Can't find a damn thing. P zero. Does that help? Maybe. <sighs> so here, yeah, you can see this changing here. And you can see the pull happening. Yeah, you can see there's a bunch of clocked pools there and then you see that uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eighteen so that's the shift pull is that the shift pause That started on pin zero before um, the value's been set. So is that just taking something out that's random? Or well, that's from the last time. Oh no, because this is from the beginning. I can kind of see it. I just wish there was a decoder in it. I thought you could add the serial decoder in. I'm going to have to look into that. Maybe you have to install um, the plugin, make it easier. But yeah, you can see the activity. It's difficult to tell where one byte transfer starts and the other finishes because you don't have any um, handshaking or anything on the UART pin here and it could be sending gibberish to start with does it send gibberish first I usually look at a couple of things and I have more anyhow we get an idea in the simulation Yeah, so it's doing a push there look, when the value is effectively random on the data in, which it then serializes. Okay, well, I'm going to call it a day for today. Um, if anyone wants to talk about this more, don't forget you can join us down at the MyStorm forum or at the uh, on, on Discord. 
um, particularly there's, there's actually a PIO section there that um, you can look at. Um, thanks for joining me, folks. And uh, I'm not sure what we're doing next week yet. Um, I've got some ideas. We could possibly do a bit more of this, but also I want to talk more generally about the purpose of off offloading IO processing in general. Um, but in the meantime, join us on the forum or Discord or whatever, uh, and we can discuss first. Thank you very much, Laurie, for um, giving us access to the Verilog that we're looking at today. Um, this is really good. It's really insightful. Um, perhaps we'll have a more general conversation about this um, next week. Anyhow, thank you guys and girls. Ciao. See you soon.